It seems like just about every design I do these days involves Bluetooth connectivity somehow. We've got Bluetooth speakers and headphones, Bluetooth coffee makers and blenders, Bluetooth fitness devices measuring our heart rates, Bluetooth cat toys. Okay, wait, maybe not that last one. Yet. But the traditional Bluetooth one-to-one pairing gets kind of clunky when you want to have more than two things connected. We need Bluetooth to grow up and behave more like a real network, right? Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. Luckily, Bluetooth is growing up and improving. And today, I want to talk about one of the coolest new capabilities. Bluetooth Mesh. Yeah, you can guess from the name what it's all about, right? My guest today is Ferdi Brillantes from Teo Uden, and let's talk about some mesh networking right now. And before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can find out more information about Bluetooth Mesh technologies from Teo Uden. Hi, Ferdi. Thank you so much for joining me. Hello, Amelia. I'm very happy to be here, and thanks so much for having me. Okay, so I am super excited to talk about Bluetooth Mesh. Now, most designers' use of Bluetooth has been limited to pairs of devices, but Bluetooth Mesh brings up the possibility of networking a whole bunch of devices, right? Yes, that's correct. So historically, Bluetooth has been used as a personal area network. But now, with the addition of Bluetooth Mesh, it opens it up to a wider variety of use cases. For example, you can use it to deploy large-scale networks, like automating a whole building. Great. Just what I was hoping for. Okay, so let's dive into some details here. How does Bluetooth Mesh work? So typically, Bluetooth devices use a point-to-point networking topology. For example, a smartphone can establish a point-to-point connection with a heart rate monitor. And then that same phone can maybe establish another point-to-point connection with a cycling sensor. But with this type of topology, there is really no way for the heart rate monitor and the cycling sensor to communicate directly. But in a mesh network, every device in the network can actually send a message to every other device in the network. So it's called a many-to-many networking topology. Also, Bluetooth mesh works on Bluetooth 4.0. There's a misconception out there that you need Bluetooth 5 for Bluetooth mesh to work. Actually, you don't. You just need Bluetooth 4. And then to send messages between devices, you would use advertising packets. And then when a device receives a message, the device can then relay that message to other devices, which extends your range and gives you the ability to cover an entire building for automation. Okay, so if I've got a bunch of Bluetooth devices, how do they become a mesh network? So just like when you buy a phone from a network provider, they have to provision your phone. The same is true with Bluetooth Mesh. You have to provision your devices. A device that's been provisioned is referred to as a node, and a device that's not yet part of the network is an unprovisioned device. Once a device is provisioned, it will have a network key that is shared with all the devices. So you have a nice secure network for communicating with all the devices in the network. Seems like there could be some undesirable side effects here, like messages looping or taking multiple routes? Yes. So they use a technique called managed flooding. A very basic flooding network might have all nodes repeat a message. But like you said, that can lead to some potential issues. That's why with Bluetooth Mesh, they came up with this thing called managed flooding. And basically, they provide certain parameters to control how messages are transmitted to other devices. For example, they have a time to live message counter, which limits the number of times a message is retransmitted. They also have a message cache, which is used to prevent endless looping of a message. So for example, if you already received a message, you don't want to send it again if for some reason you received it again. Also, the relay function is optional, so all devices are not required to act as a relay. So one of the things that they knew when they started developing the standard is that they are going to have low power nodes, devices that run on batteries. So these low power nodes they might spend most of their time in a sleep mode. So if you want to send a message to it, how is it going to receive the message if it's sleeping? So that's where the friend node comes in. So a friend node acts as a message buffer while the low power node is asleep. So when the low power node wakes up, the friend node forwards the messages to the low power node. So they also have this thing called the proxy node. So let's say you have a phone that doesn't have the mesh stack. How does that phone get on the mesh network? Well, the phone can connect to a proxy node and then the proxy node can act as a relay for the phone. So another thing about Bluetooth Mesh is that it's designed for large-scale networks. Well, 
How big is a large scale network? Well, you can have over 32,000 devices in a mesh network. So, Ferdy, what if one of the nodes goes dark? Seems like there is a redundancy built in naturally. Yes, that's correct. So if a node fails, obviously that node is not going to be able to act as a relay. So if you look at this slide, we have a switch that wants to turn on the light at the bottom. So what happens? Well, all the other surrounding nodes can still act as relays. So the message will still find its way down to the light at the bottom and it will still work. So there's no single point of failure. You have a self-healing network and you have improved reliability. Okay, let's talk about some specific solutions for Bluetooth mesh. What does Teyu Yudin offer? So right now, we actually have three Bluetooth modules that are based on Nordic Semiconductor's NRF52-832 chipset. We have the EYS HSN ZWZ, which is our ultra-small module, the smallest one in our lineup. And to give you an idea of how small this is, you can actually fit six of this on a dime. So next is our EYS HJN ZWZ, which is basically the same as our ultra-small module, but in a bigger package. And because of that, it makes it a little bit more affordable than our ultra small module. The next one is our EYS HCN ZWZ. This one is bigger because we brought out more IOs and there's additional circuitry that makes it our most power efficient module. Next is our EYS LCN ZWW module. This is based on the NRF52-810 chipset from Nordic Semiconductor, which is a more affordable chipset. So it brings down the cost of the module. A lot of times our customers have lightweight apps, so they don't need a very powerful chip. They just want the most affordable module that will meet their requirements. Okay, I'm ready to get started designing. What kind of kits or dev boards have you got for me? So the easiest way to get started is to use our eval boards or our eval kits. If you order the eval board, you just get the board. However, if you order the eval kit, you get the eval board plus the J-Link light board and the programming cables that will allow you to flash your code into the module and start debugging. All right, Ferdy, let's talk about the software side of things. So Nordic Semiconductor has a mesh SDK that is available online. So anyone can download it and start developing. Included with the SDK are several sample apps that you can use as a starting point for your project. For example, they have a light switch demo. So if you're looking to automate lights, that's the easiest way to get started. What's also nice is Nordic Semiconductor has a partnership with Seger. And with this partnership, Nordic chip users are able to use the Seger Embedded Studio IDE for free, which is great because who doesn't like free tools? Very cool. Well, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, Amelia. It was a pleasure talking to you. And before we go, you didn't forget to click that link, did you? There you can find out even more information about Bluetooth mesh technologies from Teo Yudin. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from EE Journal. For more Chalk Talks, check out the Chalk Talk section of eejournal.com or head on over to YouTube, keyword EE Journal. <laughs>